This matter of free will and its relationship to the mind is so extremely important that I've decided to include a, as lecture 18, man knowing and willing as we study this subject more deeply. One, there is never any separation between cognition or knowing and volition or willing. As a man thinks, so is he. As he is, so he thinks. Proverbs 23, 7. Two, for example, Satan wills according to his understanding. His mind opposes the God who he knows hates and punishes him. Three, unregenerate men do the same. For it's an error to suppose that there is a separation between understanding and will, which will is according to the last dictate of the understanding, as the saying goes. Five, Tariton, Edwards, and others consider that understanding to be the practical understanding, but understanding is always theoretical. Six, compare the drunkard again. He knows that the drink will satisfy him, and so he chooses to drink. He knows that the drink will hurt him only if he becomes a drunkard, and so he drinks not expecting to become a drunk. Hell, he doesn't think God will send him there because he does not expect to become a drunk. So he drinks. He does not expect to go on drinking and becoming drunk. Seven. So he does not expect to go to hell, though he knows that continuing a drunkard will bring him to that eternal end. Eight. Before his mind, he is not going to continue drinking. So he is not, before his mind, going to become a drunkard or go to hell. Nine, his understanding and will are in perfect coordination. He thinks he will not become a drunkard and be damned. So he chooses to drink. Ten, if his thinking were correct, his willing would be admirable. If his thinking is fatally incorrect, it is, but it is his thinking. Let's look at this now. Number one, there's never any separation between cognition and volition. As a man thinks, so he is. As he is, so he thinks. You think a certain way, you act a certain way. You act a certain way, it's because you think a certain way. I'm sure all of you are aware of the fact that is not axiomatic. I don't know whether it's a majority viewpoint or a minority viewpoint, but I th think it's a minority viewpoint. I know it's a minority viewpoint among Reformed theologians, as I mentioned here a little later, that there's a practical reason and a theoretical reason, and so on, and you're always willing in accord with your practical reason, but when I make the statement here, there's never any separation between cognition, thinking, reasoning, and volition or behavior. That needs to be proved. That's by no means a given axiom, indisputable, universally recognized. Let me give a few examples of what I mean before I endeavor to try to prove this point. Satan wills according to his understanding. His mind opposes the God who he knows hates and punishes him. The devils know God and they tremble. It isn't that they go on hating him, thinking they can escape him. They know better than that, but they nevertheless, knowing full well what's going to happen, they may hope they can avoid it, 
but they know full well that He is omnipotent and they are His creatures and they are in His power. He is not in their power. And you would say no creature with knowledge such as that would proceed to self-destruct. You say that's a sign of insanity, irrationality, but it's the rationality with which they live. They know very well who God is, and they even tremble. But they go on doing the things, willing the things, choosing the things, which they know certainly will bring the wrath of God down upon him. And I'm saying here that unregenerate men do the same. Now, we're talking about Adam and his nature at the beginning, and you see me moving over to Satan and to evil human beings as well, but I'm just trying to show that the makeup of a rational being, a being originally created in the image of God, is essentially the same. It has two elements, the mind and the will, and what I'm saying about that is that they are always in harmony, whether the person is sinless as Adam, or whether he is sinful as Adam's descendants, or whether he is given over to wickedness as are the demons. Their mentality is the same, and their volition is the same, and whether it's all wicked thought and wicked action, or all good thought and good action, the cognition and the volition are in harmony. So I say in number four, it's an error to suppose that there's a separation between understanding and will. Which will is according to, the reason I put this in quotes is that's the usual language, standard language, constantly used in this sphere of discourse, that the will is according to the last dictate of the understanding. All of these theologians I refer to here and allude to in my talk would say the same thing, but they qualify that by indicating that understanding here means practical understanding rather than theoretical understanding, and I'm simply saying that proposition should stand as it is without any adjectives being inserted before understanding. Understanding is fundamentally a cognitory power. It enables us to grasp concepts and ideas. That's, a, that's the meaning of it, and it's no different when it comes to the volition which follows upon it. So again, I compare the drunkard. Now again, I haven't mentioned the drunkard before, but the drunkard is a standard human illustration in this sphere of discourse. Just about everybody who ever discusses this subject talks about a drunkard. Now, so let's us face the drunkard. And though nine out of every ten who ever refer to the drunkard use it in the opposite way, there are those like myself who see that the drunkard really illustrates something other than he's usually used for in this sphere of discourse. He knows that the drink will satisfy him. That's what he knows. Here's a man who's at the bar and asking himself whether he ought to drink. He's been drunk before. He's gotten into accidents. He's had trouble with his family. All those things go through his head. And it leads most people to say that he knows very well that he ought not to take that drink. He knows it's going to bring these bad consequences. His mind is enlightened, but because he loves it so much, he goes ahead, and that's somehow or other said to be his practical understanding of the fact. I'm challenging that. I'm saying this drunkard knows. His mind, before he starts drinking, is quite clear, and he knows one thing, that he is going to have a satisfactory experience when he drinks that liquor. It always has been pleasant, and he knows it'll be pleasant again. That's what's before his mind when he drinks, and that's the reason he drinks. I would drink too. If I knew that would give me a satisfaction, 
that I could think would not have any bad effects and so on, nothing but a pleasurable taste and so on with no bad consequences. I would drink also, anybody would drink and so on. That's the way he drinks. Even though he, unlike me, had been drunk time and time and time again, what I'm saying is when he's sitting before the bar now, contemplating that first drink, he knows one thing. That drink is going to be pleasant. He can't wait to have it. That's before his mind. He knows the drink will hurt him only if he becomes a drunkard, only if he gets in his car and tries to drive home inebriated and so on. He knows that it will hurt him only if he becomes a drunkard, and so he drinks not thinking he will become a drunkard. This is the point here. He has had it happen time and again. He can't actually dismiss the idea that it might happen. But he does crowd that out. He is determined it's not going to happen. He's going to get the satisfaction of the drink without any of the bad consequences that usually follow. When he puts that cup to his mouth, it's with the knowledge. Turns out to be false, to be sure, but it's with the knowledge. It's going to taste good, and it is not, in this case, going to have the bad consequences. Otherwise, I maintain he would never drink a drop. Hell, he does not think God will send him there because he doesn't expect to become a drunk. I'm talking about a person now who knows the Bible, which says very plainly that drunkards cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And he believes the Bible, not living according to it, but at the same time he was reared in it perhaps. And certain things are clearly in his mind, especially this business about drunkards not inheriting the kingdom of God. And because he can't divest himself of the notion that's the word of God, he can't free himself from the idea that if he becomes a drunkard, he's going to go to hell. That's before his mind, but he's not going to become a drunkard. If he thought he was going to become a drunkard, if that was before his mind, and he knew he was going to hell, he wouldn't taste that drink. See, what I'm trying to say, his mind itself is seeing this drink as something good with no bad consequences, including the ultimate damnation of his soul. He does not think God will send him there to hell because he doesn't expect to become a drunk. He knows the Bible well enough to know that if he becomes a drunk, he's going to perish forever. But he's not about to become a drunk and perish forever. He's just going to enjoy a good drink. That he knows, and he also knows the other. So he drinks. He doesn't expect to go on drinking and become a drunk. The Territ and even my beloved Edwards and so on, I think, is an error on this particular point, this idea of a practical judgment. It's just the idea of the drink itself being associated with these things that overwhelms and weighs more than all the knowledge he has. I can't believe that. I believe the knowledge he has when he takes that drink is that he will not become inebriated. He'll just get the satisfaction of its taste. And therefore, the volition which follows the drinking of the drink is in perfect harmony with his rational grasp for the situation. Now, you and I know he's not thinking clearly. You and I know he's not being very rational in the sense of wise. But what I'm saying, we also know that it's what is in his mind, namely the benefit and the good and the non-evil consequences that leads him to the drinking, and that if that was not before his mind, if he knew drunkenness would follow and damnation would be the consequence and so on, I maintain he would never touch that drink again. In perfect harmony here. He is not torn apart in his inward being. He's in harmony as much as a person who abstains from a drink would be. So he doesn't, in seven, he doesn't expect to go to hell, though he knows that continuing a drunkard will bring him to that eternal end. Eight, 
before his mind, he is not going to continue drinking. So he is not before his mind choosing to become a drunkard or go to hell. His understanding and will are in perfect coordination. He thinks he will not become a drunkard and be damned, so he chooses to drink. If his drinking were correct, his willing would be admirable. His thinking is fatally incorrect, but it is his thinking. See, I mentioned the theologians, and I say at that particular point, they are decidedly the majority. I'm giving you a minority viewpoint here again, and may I say apropos that a particular point before I close off this other uh, discussion here. We are in what we call the Reformed School of Theology. Reformed Theology is what you will be getting in this series of handout tapes. I am a Reformed a theolo a theologian. It means that we belong to a certain system of doctrine. Now that system of doctrine doesn't mean that absolutely everything in it is agreed by everybody in that particular system. Some people think that if you belong to the reform system, there is no difference whatever in any item of teaching that would be coming forth from those who belong to that school. No, it's the system which is common to us all, but in a long system, in our case, we're going to be giving 100 lectures on about I suppose 60 or 70 different doctrines in that, and those would belong to this uh, particular system generally, but every now and then I mention a peculiarity of my own, which is a minority viewpoint. It doesn't knock me out of the whole system, though at this particular point I'm among a minority. Now, if that were characteristic of me, then obviously I couldn't call myself a Reformed theologian, but I'm just trying to get over to you the fact that it isn't always understood that uh, a person belonging to any system, when right now the reform system, uh, doesn't necessarily believe in all of this that's in uh, the per system as it's agreed, in, agreed on by the uh, majority. I've already indicated this matter of uh, continuous creation, which is a minority viewpoint. I join together with the fundamental idea that everything comes by God and is preserved by God, but that's a minority viewpoint. Now, here's another minority viewpoint. The idea that the volition follows, uh, excuse me, yeah, follows cognition always. That's a minority viewpoint. The common view is that the volition follows the the, uh, practical cognition, practical understanding, always. I deny that use of word. I don't think that's a meaningless term. I think cognition is strictly a matter of thinking and ideas, and that the idea which is before you at the time is the dictate of the volition. That is, you incline according uh, to what you understand. Now, I take that. Now, that is not the usual view of Reformed Theologians. That doesn't say I'm not a Reformed theologian, because I do teach the main system, but here's a point, and there's a point, and there's another point where I'm with the minority, uh, and therefore can't be said to hold the Reformed position on that when the majority hold uh, another. Now, if you really get out of line uh, with that system altogether, you'll fall into another system. It's usually called the Arminian system in the a Christian tradition and the Muslim tradition and the Buddhist tradition and every other tradition have corresponding schools of thought and systems of thought. They do hang together. We're not forcing this on the Scripture. This is a part of the Scripture. We may understand or misunderstand, but we all agree that God doesn't contradict Himself. God's proposition here follows consistently with the proposition here, and the last statement he ever makes in the Bible is harmonious with everything that goes before. Now, there'd be no variation in his mind. There would be no minority and majority reports at any particular point. But the system, I was once, uh, <laughs> once walking, uh, I had Marcus Bart as a colleague of mine at Pittsburgh Seminary years ago, 
and he was as neo-orthodox as his more famous father, Karl uh, Barth, was. And one of the differences between the old orthodoxy and the new orthodoxy is right at this point. The old orthodoxy saying the sort of thing I'm saying here. Truth is systematic. It is harmonious. Now that is out of court. The whole idea is out of court. It may or may not be systematic. It's usually not systematic. When God speaks, you just listen to what he says. You don't look at whether it's harmonious or not harmonious. And their, their theology is full of all sorts of discrepancies. That doesn't bother them in the slightest. As I think I may have mentioned already in this course, Bruner goes so far as to say that contradiction is a hallmark of truth. We say in orthodox circles, contradiction is a hallmark of error. It proves that God is saying in one place what he said in another place was false, and that is actually blasphemous. But what I was going to say about my friend Marcus Bart at that time is I remember walking across the breezeway as he went to his New Testament class and I to my church history class. He was saying to me, Jack, what's so important about system? Jack, what's so important about system? Well, as I say, Marcus, if there weren't a systematic unfolding of truth, if there really was a paradoxical and contradictory set of doctrines in the Bible, don't you have to admit they would, they would cancel each other out and you wouldn't know what to believe? How could God communicate anything to us at all if in one breath he says something and the next breath he says the opposite? But uh, never could get through to Marcus on that. I think the reason for it is that the people think that uh, you're forcing things. You're making them systematic. And worse than that, you're sitting in judgment on God and you're making him fit your procrustean bed and so on. And you know, if you were doing that, of course, that would be real blasphemy. Who am I? Who is any Reformed theologian to tell God what he has to say? But God is the one who speaks systematically. And we can see that if he's going to speak unsystematically and contradictorily and paradoxically and so on, he would never carry out what his mission is in giving us the book, namely to communicate information to us. Some people like to say he can think that way. Well, maybe he can. But he can't and we can't. He hasn't made us able to think that way. And if the Bible is not a communication among the members of the Trinity, but a communication of the Trinity to the creatures they've made who can't think paradoxically like that, who can't actually suppose that God can both, uh, Christ can both be God and not God, that God can be sovereign and not sovereign, and so on, then he can't communicate that way. He must communicate in a way that the creature can understand what he is saying to us. We're not forcing this on God. God is doing this because he's adapting it to the creatures which he has made. But this is just by way of elaboration here to indicate the fact that though we are systematic theologians and we recognize that the Bible is itself systematic, that doesn't mean that there is no room for difference at all and no area where we actually do differ with one another because we have a fundamental harmony, the main points of the system are agreed by all of us as true. And I would say with respect to handout theology, this I think any Reformed theologian would say is a variety of Reformed theology being given by a Reformed theologian who has a few peculiarities all his own as most Reformed theologians do and usually points them out to the hearers so that they will know when they are in that kind of uh, territory. Now, it isn't only the theologians who get into this area, but the psychologists themselves talk about cognitive dissonance. The Harvard psychologist Boring used to make a good deal of that. And they're really, uh, they may not be theologians and may know nothing at all about the Bible, but as expert psychologists, they use this particular phrase to indicate that human beings are frequently torn apart by the disharmony in their being between their reason and their will or judgment. The will is out of harmony with the mind. There is a 
dissonance between what they think and what they choose actually to do. But see, I'm saying to them, I'm not a psychologist. I'm a theologian. And I know nothing uh, expert about, uh, about psychology. But I am simply saying, as a person who has some awareness of the nature of human makeup, that can't possibly be. Man does actually uh, uh, act in accord with his uh, judgment. The will is according to the last dictate of the understanding. And then I would say to my professional psychological friends, look a little more closely. They had invariably used the drunkard too, you know, or the, ad, the drug addict or whoever it may be. That uh, look a little bit more closely and see whether or not what you're calling dissonance is not something other than a real discord between the cognition and the dissonance. With respect to the drunkard, as I said in some detail to you here, you look at that man. You think that before his mind is the possibility of inebriation, the certainty of it, and all the consequences that go with the family and with the car and all that type of thing, and if he be a biblical man, even with eternal destiny and such things as that. So you think that since he has certain knowledge, he therefore acts according to that. But if you look carefully and you interrogate that person very, very thoroughly, see if you don't find. If when it comes to the moment of lifting the glass, what's before his mind is nothing other than the judgment this is going to be a good taste with beneficial effects and no really harmful consequences, whatever, so that in the last analysis, there is no such thing as cognitive dissonance. Apropos Adam and the fall, you see, what it would mean is that when the uh, Satan came before them with this particular temptation, their mind understood what he was saying, their mind realized what God had said, and they, knowing full well that uh, God had forbidden this, they nevertheless disbelieved it at the time. They were deceived into thinking that God was mistaken. And when they actually ate of that forbidden tree, they did so in perfect harmony with their judgment. I have biblical support for that. Eve was deceived. In her own thinking, it was right to eat that fruit when she did that and when the world fell in collapsing around her ears as her husband Adam followed her example.